think you should do what the officers tell you, but now I changed my mind. Yeah, man, you should just kill them. <laughs> They're alive! They are not! You just shot one through the head! They're morgue meats! Look, guys, I don't want to kill anybody else. Hey, you don't want to go to jail, though. Jail? That's it. That's exactly it. They'll throw me in one of those rubber rooms. I won't be able to hurt anybody else. Cuff me! Okay, just... Drop the knitting needles. That's probably not a good idea. Why don't you just cuff me, okay? Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Two Guys and Some Horror. I'm joined, as always, every week by my favorite co-host, Clark. How you doing today, bud? I think I'm okay, Mr. Curdy. Curtis? the master of the curting. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. I'm really excited this week to talk about one of my favorite uh, movies from my childhood. Um, I don't know how much you watched this back when you were a kid or when you were younger, teenage years, whatever, what what, what have you. Uh, but I definitely know that this movie was on a lot in my household around Halloween. No, I, I saw this movie like 2006, 2006, 2007 on the Sci-Fi Channel. So I... I Definitely didn't even know it existed. I thought this was just like one of those random B-rated movies, and I saw I saw the point like the, the very beginning I saw was when he was talking to his undead friends. So I didn't see it from the start. So this is my first uh, time actually seeing the whole thing. Holy smokes, that's exciting! Because, like I said, I mean I've seen this movie countless times. I mean every single year around Halloween this this comes on because it just it gives me that October feel. That's one of the reasons why I picked it for. Um, specifically this time of the year just because I it the okay so let's just get into the movie right let's just start let's jump in before I go too crazy um we're doing idle hands if you didn't pick up on it from the open uh that's the film that that I picked uh it's from 1999 our director is Rodman Flender he's done he's done tons of direction on television series um our writers are Terry Burton um, and Ron Milbauer, they're also writers for a lot of TV series. It looks like they do a lot of work together, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, the film stars Devin Sawa as Anton, Seth Green as Mick, Eldon Henson as Nub, and the beautiful Jessica Alba as Molly. The beautiful. Um, some films of note for these four main actors in this film. Uh, Devin Sawa's in things like the Final Destination series. He was also in movies from my childhood like Casper and Little Giants. So I have a, uh, you know, a soft spot for him already because I already like a lot of the stuff that he's in. Seth Green, if you know, you know, like he's in a lot of stuff. If you don't know Seth Green, um, just Google him. I'm sure you'll recognize him. Then you have Eldon Henson who plays Nub, which is from, uh, I know him mostly from the Mighty Ducks. Uh, and the Daredevil TV show that he did with Netflix, but That's he's also right. he's foggy. yeah, <laughs> yep. didn't even I did not connect those dots. I was like, man, I haven't seen this guy act in a long time. I did not recognize. Yep, now he's grown up. <laughs> and then uh, he's also in the Butterfly Effect. Um, and then finally, Jessica Alba. Also, if you know, you know, like she's a big star. You know who that is if you've probably seen her before. So uh, um, she was the. Uh, Joss Whedon, one of Joss Whedon's first shows, main character. I think it was like City Angels or something. I don't, Dark Angel. I don't remember. Dark Angel sounds right. City of Angels sounds like a, a different that show. That sounds like a Nicolas Cage movie. Uh, so our budget, talking about this movie, how you were, how you saw it for the first time on sci-fi, it's it's funny to hear um, you you call it like a B, you know, B flick or whatever, but it's really insane when you think about it because the budget was $25 million and the film only pulled in, I think it was like $4 million. Uh, it grossed during its open or, some, you know, some really ridiculously low budget uh, or low pool based on its budget. So, I mean, this it, film was aimed towards like outcasts and people like me who liked uh, the offspring when watching the offspring get murdered by a devil hand, you know, kind of like that. The rebel culture back in the day with like punk music and everything. Definitely. Most definitely. I would agree with you. I didn't want to interrupt. That's why I gave you that moment to. Uh, to collect and get get more in there it's juicy i liked it um our story is pretty generic too it's it's a teenager slacker uh, teenage slacker's right hand becomes possessed with murderous intent but the i think the interesting part to me is the background where this idea comes from um so i don't know if you did much digging or or how much you dug into this film but 
the movie itself, uh, the story, is based off of Maurice Renard's novel, um, The Hands of Orlock, or Mad Love, which is a tale of a pianist who has the hands of a murderer grafted to his arms. And oh, that's, yeah. that's basically what we get here, except for, you know, he's not a pianist. He's a stoner. Well, what about <laughs> Manos' Hands of Fate? I haven't seen that yet. I haven't seen that one yet either. Uh, I might have oh, to throw that on the list. Next on the, yeah. <laughs> next on the list. I heard it's like legendarily one of the worst movies. But anyhow, kind of going back. Not a problem. Yeah. This, really uh, it just, it's just really interesting to hear. There's, there was a lot of backlash around 99 when this movie came out because it's a story of a kid who kills his parents, kills his friends. Um, and it was right around the Columbine uh, shooting. So, you know, some people were crying out that this film shouldn't have come out. Columbia Pictures should have held off. And I mean, just personally, I disagree. I don't think this movie has that great of a connection to a school shooting. It doesn't seem like something that should have caused so so much outrage. But um, that's the time that we were living in, 1999. Um, as a kid growing up, I mean, I was in high school, um, you know, early 99, late 2000s, I think. Um, I was probably in elementary school or junior high when this initially came out saw it for the first time and then watched it pretty religiously later on through junior high and high school. I don't feel like this comes anywhere near close to a school shooting kind of feel, but I'm, I'm curious your thoughts. I just want to hear a little bit more if you think that that's just bogus or, or well, warranted. Are, well, there's an outrage machine and it doesn't really matter what you do. Something's always going to outrage someone. They're going to say it's poorly timed. It doesn't really matter. And it, it, look, man. People are just wired to get upset at stupid things. And I don't think this movie has any relation to Columbine just because there's death and people like, ugh, or my feelings. Just kind of like, you know, there's no relation. There's no relation to a school shooting. This is just a fun movie. Cool. Nope. We're in complete agreement. Once again, I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, so initial thoughts on this film. I want to hear your initial thoughts. Um, I've heard a little bit already, but if you have any more or if you have a deeper initial thought kind of posed let's let's get that up oh well, sure like i said this is kind of like a 90s outcast uh, film where kind of you have the offspring the the entire band the offspring you have blink 182 songs you have sublime songs like this is music from my my uh, middle school generation kind of reaching an adulthood p period and i don't know this movie is just made for fun there's no explanation of why his hand gets possessed there's no explanation of anything really they just kind of throw out random things and they have fun with it just zombies appear and then, then they become angels like why not why not man totally have fun druid uh what was it druid princess no that's space druid balls priestess, yeah druid priestess <laughs> uh yeah. you you mentioned something that i definitely want to talk uh, and break that open real quick because it doesn't have anything to do with the movie or the plot uh it has to do with the soundtrack so this soundtrack you're right like this soundtrack is uh a punk or a stoner Skateboard. Or, you know, a skater. Yeah. Like, I mean, a lot of these songs I listened to growing up as well. Is there any song specific that you remember from the movie that you just totally loved or thought it was like the perfect fit? It's, honestly, man, I don't know about perfect fit, but we had like, just, we had the Ramones like, hurry, 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 hubba, dubba, do, or Blitzkrieg. Was it Blitzkrieg? Bob? I don't remember, but probably not the Ramones. I don't know. But then we had like Sublime Santeria play. We had uh, Blink-182 love song play. It, maybe not love song. I don't remember what it was. But there's tons of skater music. And I don't know if anything really stuck out to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds like my 90s middle school years in California. Yes. Nice. OK, cool. I think I think the only song that was like perfect or if I had to pick one that was perfect off this album, um, there's two two potentials for me. It was Santeria when they're all getting high. Um, I mean, you met your stoner, it's playing Santeria. How is that not, you know, it's, it's such a good, uh, pick, but then you I also the meet, too. it does. It, it, uh, I think they round it out. Well, um, they, they do a really good job. I think of, of giving you something in the beginning of the movie and then making that call back at the end of the movie to really circle through and, and drive home, uh, a theme or an idea that they were trying to build. Um, the other song that I thought was kind of perfectly placed was Shout at the Devil with the neighbor, the, the, the you know, the real, the badass of the movie, but he just <laughs> looked like a regular guy. Uh, in fact, he looked a little too cute to me to be that tough guy in the film, but I thought they were just, you know, perfectly placed songs. Um, cool. Well, I just had to give a shout out to that soundtrack because it really is like, 
one of the best soundtracks to to a, a horror film, if not the best for a comedy horror film um, out there. Okay, let's see. I want to talk about the open for for a quick okay. minute. So I don't know. Scream is my favorite film open. Okay, Drew Barrymore's role, that whole cat and mouse, that that whole open is amazing to me. But the parents in this film, for some reason, like I feel like this open is so much more it's just better than a lot of other ones so it might be up there in my like top five type top 10 for sure for mom for and dad f- tobias <laughs> yes mama and papa tobias but- oh, i love connie ray she's a great actress and fred william fred willard is in a lot of comedy films and he's very iconic if you've if you see his face you're like oh yeah i know him he's the uh i think he's a producer in anchorman he's uh one of the uh He's in Best in Show. He's in Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. A uh, very prolific acting career for most of these like adults. Just uh, that scene, kind of where you're going here. Like I, I, I'd have to say, I would agree with you. It's probably one of the best '90s horror movie intros for a comedy. Agreed. Once again, wow, we're we're on a roll today. No arguments here. Um, right, well, this is not a this is not an easy movie to dislike because you know what it is. You know, it's not supposed to be taken seriously. So I can ask my questions. I can look at plot holes. But then like, I'm like, it doesn't even matter because this movie doesn't care. No, it's just having fun. And that's, I mean, it yeah. knows what it is. It's its not trying to be more than, um, you know, a comedy horror. And that's what makes it, I think, even more relatable. And it takes itself serious enough to where you can just kind of enjoy the ride. I love it. So we're going to break apart or I'm going to break apart a couple of our characters here just so people can kind of get a cool intro to to Anton and the stoner buddies and all that. So the first character that uh, you meet after um, the parents get whacked, which, by the way, that blood splash after the mom gets killed under the bed or whatever. Like, how epic was that? I mean, if you thought there's a lot of blood (laughs) and his hand just like her body must have just exploded. I I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. How, that was epic. How he didn't realize he was the one murdering his parents, I will never understand. You know, um, I think you could just chalk it up to being a stoner. I did love the the ceiling writing that says, I'm under the bed. That's uh, probably one of my favorite memories as a kid. Yeah, watching this movie for the first time. And how they blame it on him. They blame Anton. Like, Oh, it's Anton. Well, does. He didn't help me put up the Halloween decorations. And the mom's like, we can get a cornucopia for Thanksgiving. We just put up the Halloween decorations. Not Very my classic, not my little uh, scooter. <laughs> yeah. That whole scene. Yeah, yeah, that whole that whole open is just I think it's just uh, it's cheeky fun. It's good. It's it's uh, it's a great uh, expectation set. Right. It's, it's right there from that moment, from the beginning of this movie. Your expectation better be set. If you think you're getting something else, uh, you know you you definitely miss the point of the open. Um, but yeah, so we get we get Anton. Anton wakes up. You know he's walking downstairs. Whatever. He's got his music playing. He's the, the blood of his parents. Yeah. So he makes his mayo. Uh, his uh, Oscar Mayer. I don't even know. He's got his bologna That's not sandwich the, or the whatever. Name. That was that was later. Well, first he he smokes his uh, his inhaler. Yep. Pipe. So he has his yeah his asthma inhaler, and he actually has that. Uh, it's not an inhaler. He has you know it's a it's a pipe basically built into it. He he holds his weed in it and he smokes out of it. It's, it's quite He's ingenious. Always <laughs> He's always holding. Um, but I just I see him. He's it's so funny. He's so oblivious and lazy. Um, you get that right off the bat and then he's so privileged at the same time like he doesn't have to do anything he doesn't have to uh you know he needs if he needs something mom and dad mom we're out of we're out of milk you know mom ma, yeah, yeah that's my favorite line <laughs> ma we're out of milk dog comes up picks up its food bowl drops it ma we're out of dog food and then he just carries on like not not waiting for a response, he just knows if he yells "mom," whatever, she's gonna handle it. She's gonna take care of it, and it drives. Well, he it, hasn't uh, seen his parents in a few days at this point. Yes, right? yeah, that's what he says. He says it's been a few days since I've seen my parents. I, I wonder <laughs> what's going on. 
But he doesn't. We don't know that. We think it's like the night before until until he goes to his friend's house and he says, like, it's been a few days since I've seen my parents. Yeah, that's that's very true. So yeah. he wakes up. He wakes up out of his stoner, you know, lifestyle or whatever, you know, whatever dream he had going on. He wakes up and he's he's running through all this stuff. You know, he's trying to smoke a bowl. He's got no more weed. So he calls his buddy and uh, he tells him, hey, this ain't Domino's. Like, get, get your ass up. And he responds. Uh, Anton goes, but I'm comfortable. Click. You know, Nub hangs up on him. Yeah, basically. they're making him come over and he asks him if they're holding. Dude, I love that. And he's like, I didn't say what I was holding. Grabs his nuts. Grabs his nuts. Grrr. But he was holding. He lied to him. So I'm curious about that, too. Let's break that apart for a second. So he's sitting there. They're eating cheesy puffs or whatever. And he kind of looks over in between the couch or the chair cushion and finds the baggie. Either he lied or he was so stoned that he forgot he, he put a bag of weed there and then found it. Nobody nobody gets that stoned. <laughs> Okay. You never forget. They never forget. Stuff. Okay. They never forget where their weed was. Fair enough. You'd always know Am where I you got your stash. From experience, maybe. I'm sure we have enough listeners out there. There's enough people in the horror fam who could understand what we're talking about when it comes to holding. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's like, uh, well, the marijuanas, the marriage wanes. And he's marijuana. Like, Why don't you go smoke some oregano and some. Uh, I don't remember the other one is. Uh, Oregano was very common. Oregano and nutmeg. Yeah, so it was very common for like kids to put that in baggies and sell it to other kids and tell them it was weed, and then they go, "Oh man, I'm so high!" And it's just like, "No, man, you're not." So I'm pretty sure when I was a teenager, uh, this movie might have caused my brother and I to try and smoke oregano at a young age. Funny enough, I'm actually allergic to oregano. Uh, I can't have it in food. Yes, you are. Yeah, we so go to oregano's for uh, for <laughs> work lunches when we were working together. Uh huh. I uh, I get really bad stomach aches and uh, break out in a in like a blotchy um, rash on my forehead. So funny enough that nutmeg and oregano is is used in this movie because I'm like, man, if I smoked oregano, I wonder what kind of crap I'd feel. Probably terrible. Um, what's even funnier is is so nub. Uh, so we this is where we meet Seth Green and Eldon Henson's characters. Mick, the redheaded uh, friend. Funny that they call him Mick. I'm sure it's just his name. But Mick also has like Irish tendencies. And Seth Green is a redhead, but not really in this film. So I don't know if there was like a joke that they were trying to play. Um, but, but Eldon, you know, tells him, why don't you go try nutmeg and oregano or whatever. Um, oddly enough... When he goes home and and smokes the oregano and nutmeg, that's when he thinks that like the nutmeg and oregano may have caused him to have these murder murderer tendencies. You know, it's kind of funny that that those two things kind of collided. I didn't. I don't know if it's just plot filler or what, but interesting still. Let's see. There you go. Um. So yeah. So we meet. You know the two the two best buddies. I don't really know what else yep. to say about them other than they're great comedic uh, relief. They're really well, good Seth with. Green is a, he's a '90s staple in that time, like from then to the late 2000s. You know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Slayer was in a lot of things, and he still is to this day. Yeah, Eldon Henson, I'd say, got the shorter you know shorter career track. Right, he's got less probably, but he's still just as funny. And pairing him with Seth Green was a great choice by the the casting well, he... team. This isn't the first uh, movie or he was in with Seth Green either. He was in, uh, there was another movie with Jennifer Love Hewitt. Uh, I forgot what it Can't was. Can't Hardly Wait? Can't Hardly Wait, exactly. Classic. Yeah, so he was in that as well. During this oh. conversation where they're like chilling and hanging out, uh, they also keep pressuring Anton because he's got, he's such a shy chicken shit when it comes to going and talking to his girl crush, Jessica Alba, um, who's named Molly in the film. So if I say Molly, that's who we're referring to. But um, that whole situation, I know you text me a comment, so I'll get you right up to it, and then I'll let you take over from there. But she, you know, she's driving by on her motorcycle or riding by on her motorcycle, and she drops her notebook. Take us away, Clark. On purpose. On <laughs> purpose, by the way. Had to have been. I don't – yeah, excuse me, miss. Can I see your... Oh, yeah, he picks it up. He runs outside and he just smells it. That's what I was hoping for. He like, picks it up and he just goes... Mm, yeah. 
<laughs> you smell. I think walks to her house and just like. And I, I just told you, I was like, yeah, every time, you know, whenever I pick up a girl's notebook, I, this is the first impression I get is to just smell it. And if you don't get smell it, whiff of it, you're not doing it right. If you don't smell it, you're not doing it right. I, I just, he goes to her house, though, and like he gives it to her and he just pussies out. He doesn't even talk to her. He just runs off. And at this point, his hands, he doesn't even realize his hand's a murderer. So I, I'm curious, when did you pick up the twitching in the hand? I didn't pay attention to the twitching. I, I saw like once when his friends, when he f discovers that his parent, his parents dead bodies by accident, because he smell, I guess he's smelling and he smells something weird in the house after the Jessica Alba thing, he runs home uh, and he finds his parents bodies un underneath the pumpkins. The like, then when his friends show up and he just brutally murders them without like trying to, that's when I noticed same here, same here. So there was an there was some fan article where if you watch Devin Sawa, apparently he was and this is their <clears throat> like their idea, their fan fiction stuff. I don't know if it's true or not, but if you watch apparently in the beginning of the movie when he's doing certain things, you can kind of notice the hand twitches for a second. Um and I I don't think that's ever been confirmed, but it'd be kind of neat to know from Devin Sawa's perspective if he was doing anything subtly to try and make it look like his hand was already possessed at that point i'm i'm curious because that would be a cool little fun fact um but yeah i <clears throat> you know i watched this movie and i tried to look to see if i noticed any weird twitches or any weird hand gestures or anything like that i didn't see anything uh pop out to me so i was just curious i only noticed after you know the bottle goes in seth green's head and um he kills his friend unfortunately um but real quick on jessica alba did you expect her to be such a freak in the sheets uh, yeah, so, like, as soon as the, they get together and he just starts grabbing her ass, she's all into it because she's into him. Like, sure. She, she dropped that notebook on purpose, and she's like, I want this guy. And as soon as he, like, grabs her, she's like, finally, he's showing me how much he likes me. Now he can be my man. So I just, I was like, all right, whatever. That's I just, cool. I just love the character dynamic because for in so many of those 90s films, um, when you watch girls, especially, like, you know, actresses who get put into these roles to be the specific um, girl crush or heroine of the film, uh, a lot of times they're like goody two shoes and they they don't have that uh, freak in the sheet kind of feel. And when you're watching this for the first time, I like your word. Go ahead. Freak in the sheet. <laughs> freak, freaks in the sheet. Uh, or freak in the sheet. You want a lady in the street, but a freak in the bed. Um, so. It's just funny because you watch her and the way she dresses, everything she does is always so proper. But the minute that he's really talking to her and his hands going nuts and he's covered in blood too, which is really funny. They, you, you know, she, fight. she's like, come on in, you know, just come on in. She's, she's like pulling him in. She's wanting him to come in. She's home alone. You know, she's, she's trying to get to that next step with him. So I just, I found it really funny how fast they just let you know right away. Like she's not your ordinary girl. She's not your your normal girl next door. She's totally different and uh, in some ways maybe better. Um, shout out to Vivica A. Fox in her role in this movie because I thought it was a real fun side role uh, from our main characters. I'm not sure your opinion on the druidic uh, priestess. Oh no, but... I'm I'm into her. Like she's my she's the most attractive uh, person in this whole film, and she's like a badass. I'm in. Yeah, I, I loved her character. I thought it was great. The story plot, um, you know, like we talked about, there's a lot of holes. There's a lot of things left untold, but I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. it tells us enough to get us by and, and keep us hooked and, and following along. So I always thought that was a lot of fun. When she first shows up as the nun uh, going to meet the prisoner or whatever, I couldn't stop laughing because, like, that whole scene is just so – it feels one, it feels rushed a little quick. Right. They're trying to just get it in and get it out to introduce the character. But when she jumps out of her outfit and she's mapping the kills on the, the map in her trailer and then she makes the pentagram and she goes, oh, my God. And she knows right where to go. So she just jumps. You know, she starts to drive in her trailer every time okay. they show that trailer. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Go, keep going. I'm, I was going to say I have something to say later. I was just going to say every time they, they show that trailer, it's cutting off a car. Or doing something illegal when it's driving, like every time, and I just, <laughs> I don't know. Doesn't care. Yeah, it doesn't care. Doesn't care. 
So I wanted to say that when we first meet her, when she's like dressed as the nun and the the precinct or whatever, and she meets kind of like that bearded guy whose hand just is like completely limp and flaccid. I didn't pick up on that, like the flaccid dead hand until like the second time I watched this when I was prepping yesterday. And uh, that was probably, I wish, I don't know. And I know this would have made the movie worse. I kind of was like hoping for a little bit more background on like where this hand was earlier or whatnot. But once you what start are... explaining things like this, it gets worse. So I'm going to use my imagination, but okay. I don't know how this hand like moved around. And like in, my, in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Really cool to think about. So what about a, a remake in today's day and age? A lot of things are getting remade into like television series. Net, you know, Netflix is picking stuff up. Amazon Prime is doing a really good job of that. Hulu's doing their own thing. Countless others, you know, different television networks, whatever. Um, would I mean, you we see? We have Ash vs. Evil Dead. We have uh huh. Season one where his hand, you know, is back. Or Army of not Army of Darkness. Uh, Evil Dead Two. So I don't know. I think we have plenty of like hands that are just murderer movies i was thinking more along the lines following vivica a fox in the pre-telling coming up to the film oh vivica a fox i would like to see her again i would like to say debbie liqueur back oh my god what a great name yeah yeah uh now vivica a fox is exactly that she is a fox and i'm in i'm in if they bring her back for like a sequel where she's finding like evil feet or something like that i'd i'd be sold like more limbs bring more limbs and the limbs are joining together to to create like the ultimate like satan or something i'm like yeah animated series yes for that regular series Um, stick to the pre i'd say stick to the precursor leading up to have have a man make it a make it a trilogy (laughs) (laughs) marvel all right all right i'm i don't know thanos but in body form uh, <laughs> um all right so just a quick rundown of some some other fun stuff that happens in the movie the when anton kills his friends um it's to me that scene that whole the way it breaks down and how it turns out is just it's so comical you can't i mean you can't get mad you don't want to get mad because the friends realize that he in fact is the killer you know there's the missing shirt piece that happens to be in you know it matches his shirt perfectly i mean the fact that he's covered uh in some kind of mess is interesting his hand also has the bioilluminescent you know ink on it which is what he wrote i'm under the bed with um unfortunately though he ends up you know murdering his two best friends one with a beer bottle to the head seth green what an amazing makeup job by the way they do on these guys for the rest of the movie because it's pretty believable the amount of CGI they have to put into Nub's character, though, with the decapitation portion is, you know, obviously it's CGI. It's hard to do, but I thought it looked really good. Sold. I'm in. I'm in. Sold. Yeah, um, yeah, there was an actually actor. There was an actor who played the hand. who was Christopher Hart. But uh, when the hand was attached to uh, Anton, it was completely all him, which I really enjoyed that. The whole part where he's murdering his friends, throwing like decapitates one of them with a with a saw blade and the other one gets like jammed in the head with a broken bottle i was like yeah cool (laughs) then they come back to life though which is completely random but you know it's a fun movie no explanation just murder two friends they're the only ones who come back i honestly watched it this time hoping there was an explanation and once again you know you're left not to not to worry about that. Please, please do not worry about why we bring these two characters back other than the fact that we paid them a butt, buttload of money and we need to get it out of them and it'll be funny. Well, when yeah, he's when eating the burrito. When they're, <laughs> when they're undead and he's like throwing cheesy poofs in his mouth and the, mouth and like the cops show up. <laughs> the same cops I cost him like earlier in the film because they're dorks, uh, which I told you I was like, these guys are going to die first, which they didn't, unfortunately. But they did but they, die. They did die, and in, in a pretty funny tasered, fashion. <laughs> tasered in the face, and the other one gets knitting needles stuck in his, his head because, you know, idle hands are the devil's tool, so he's trying to keep his hands busy playing with uh, the knitting. And they're like, put the knitting needles down. Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. And he's like, keeps knitting as he's doing this. And he's like, doing an okay job knitting. And then murders both officers in a hilarious fashion. 
but before that like they shoot nub right in the head and he's like well you know i was gonna say do what the officers tell you but now just kill him what else do we got i mean i don't want to miss any other big points but i mean this is just a fun watch film this is i think anybody that picks it up could understand that especially in in the you know in the horror fam world this isn't something unfortunately i don't think this would be something that we'd get on a joe bob briggs but uh, I think it's filled with a lot of laughs, um, some good moments of horror, and overall just a fun watch for me around around the Halloween season, which we're in, we're in the midst of. So, you know, can't can't really complain about this film. Is there any other topics you wanted to hit or any other scenes you want to talk about before we move on? Man, like the fast food scene, maybe, but like I don't I don't think that really warrants i think anybody who sees the movie will just enjoy it because he he tries to figure out when he's trying to figure out like how to to stop his hands from murdering people he goes to that satanist guy randy who just listens to like metal and stuff like shout of the devil and randy (laughs) is the love interest of uh because this this ties into later and randy's like oh if your hand's going crazy maybe keep him busy i was the same way blah 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 and randy goes to uh vivica fox's character debbie lecure and he's the one that actually tells her about uh, Anton's issue, which kind of furthers the plot along. Yeah, I mean, there's a but whole, yeah. just to kind of, I guess we could fast forward and, and just a uh, high level overview of what happens. So you get, so you have now um, Randy, is it Randy's character and Vivica A. Fox? I think that's who it is. And they're running around trying to find uh, Anton and they end up crossing Anton and, and the two friends or whatever. They're on their way to the high school dance where Molly's waiting for uh, Anton and then the hand ends up going after Anton chops off his hand. Um, You know, the hand ends up escaping and going to the high school dance to kill the girl Um, because apparently he's going to, you know, the hand's going to take her to hell with him at midnight. That's also not really a whole lot of information that we get other than um, (laughs) the uh, Druidic uh, priestess telling us that. So the there's a lot of action that kind of goes down at the high school. There's a you know there's a whole hostage situation where Molly's tied to the top of a car and the car is being lifted and it's gonna squish her. And, and then there's an epic bong scene. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I arc welded it and shit. You did not. You don't even take out of shop. Well, I think you get maybe one of your best quotes uh, from Nub from Nub, which is as usual. Marijuana saves an otherwise disastrous day. Um, yeah. So yeah, if we don't get that quote in, film. if we don't get that quote in, we that's screwed up. <laughs> no, it's it's a true story. Look, man, I've had some bad days, and when I have marijuana, and sometimes it makes it better, sometimes it just makes me lazy. There you what, go. Ab- what about Debbie? So Debbie Lacour, um, after the hand, you know, they she throws a dagger at the hand. It it lands in Seth Green's chest, and it's just this like small puff of smoke. And there's the whole conversation oh, yeah. about that's it. It evaporates. <laughs> He's like, that's it. No explosion. No fire and brimstone. Man, I got gypped. Yeah. And then Debbie's like, my work here is done. Time for the ritualistic sex. And she grabs Randy and him and her are walking off to go, go get it on. <laughs> yeah, you can yeah, tell. He's Randy. excited. Randy's probably my favorite character in the film. But we forgot your namesake, Curtis. We forgot Curtis. And I wanted to talk about it as Curtis is grab probably my favorite kill scene in the film. I'm sweating off my makeup, Curtis. <laughs> so Curtis you know, he's in a car and we get to yep. see our obligatory, you know, horror movie boobs as he's touching them and holding them. She's like, oh, yeah, there, there. And we see the hand kind of like gliding up to the top, chokes her, snaps her neck. And then Curtis, I'm sorry, your namesake dies. And uh, when Nub walks up, when they see the dead bodies, Nub's like, oh, man, he's like, I thought you hated Curtis. He's like, yeah, but what a waste of, of, of girl or something like that funny scene very funny i think nub probably so to me nub's probably my favorite character because he has all of a lot of the one-liners that are really funny yeah. um like when molly's dress rips off when she's tied to the car he goes bet she wins best costume like <laughs> like little stuff like that are really good um so, but we could go yeah, i could go on great. a slew <laughs> i wanted to talk about the, the guy who played curtis by the way real quick okay like your namesake he was in like a couple movies in the 90s in the early 2000s and since then, he's just been doing video game voices. I don't think he could. I don't know why he's not getting work, but like he's just like Final Fantasy 13, two additional voices, Soul Calibur five, Maxi, Final Fantasy Type Zero attack, 
additional voices. So I'm sorry, Curtis. You just your career just didn't take off. You know, I I would disagree. I'm doing great with voice acting. People really like the way I sound. Um, you know, catch me on Soul Calibur, I guess. Yeah, you know, Maxi <laughs> Soul Calibur Five. Check out Curtis as Maxi. Check me out. I can beat Yoda up. Uh, um, <laughs> all right, let's let's go ahead and uh, move on to our fun facts and trivia. So you brought up something I thought was really great. I'm sad um, you didn't finish the thought on it when we were talking about the hand. So uh, he's a magician, Christopher Hart. Um, he plays the hand in the film. He's also, it's the same hand that appears in Adam's Family from 1991. I'm thinking that's what you were going to finish that thought if you if you had. Uh, the, uh, no, I was just saying oh. he was in a green suit, and I could tell he was in a green suit. And he was, did a really good job, you know, sharpening his bones and the pencil sharpener and all that. Very, very good job being a hand. Great hand. I would love to see the behind the scenes footage for just for the hand because the hand was pretty sweet. More than likely, I think he was just in a green suit. Uh, I think it's funny that the offspring perform I Want to Be Sedated and Beheaded by the Ramones. Really? Or Sedated by the Ramones and then Beheaded. Because, you know, you don't you don't expect the offspring to be at a high school uh, dance in the first place, especially not during the height of their career in 1999. No, definitely. And I mean, when I was listening to it, I was like, man, who, you know, I I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not as well attuned to what bands look like. I just listen a lot of times. I don't go to a lot of concerts, things like that. So for me, I didn't even know who it was until um, you pointed it out. I, I really didn't know. Oh, no, man. Like my second time watching the film, I'm like that is legitimately the offspring. And I don't know why. Yeah, because the lead singer's the guy who dies. Like his his head gets like he gets scalped, scalped by the hand. Yeah, crazy enough. Like that twenty five million dollar budget got used for sure. So, so apparently, the, uh, there are, there are a couple deleted scenes that okay. are just randomly in there too. Like where Jessica Alba, I guess she can play the bass, but we never get a to see beyond just her in the background when Anton throws up. He does talk about that. I thought it was kind of cool. So. Anton, throughout the entire film, right, he just keeps putting on different pieces or articles of clothing. Um, like he, you know, he gets up in the morning, he throws on his shirt, he puts on uh, Nub's no pants. Boxers, just boxers. Yeah, and yeah, then Nub tells him, pants. hey, he grabs the you want some pants, dude, hero? Uniform. Yep. So throughout the entire he film, hand. throws all this clothes on. Hand. He never takes yeah. off a, a single article of clothing until he's in the hospital at the end of the film. Oh, that's a good point. I like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good By one. Way, Great ending. Yeah, you want to talk about it? No, nah, I just liked it. I, okay, I, just checking. I thought it was funny. It was, I can't believe you didn't go to heaven, heaven to kick it with me. He's in a full body cast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Jessica Alba was 17 years old when she filmed this. Holy smokes. So this this film was shot in the same neighborhood as Halloween from 1978. That was, to me it was is, is in awesome. Haddonfield? It was filmed in Haddonfield, which is uh, in California. No wonder. <laughs> no wonder all this happened. Obviously, that neighborhood's jinxed. So the school gym where they filmed the Halloween dance is the same gym that's used in a couple other films. So Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the movie, and Jawbreaker. So if that gym looks familiar to you, that's probably why. A, it looks like every other school gym that ever was made. And B, it is used in two other films. Solid. Shout out to Dawn of the Dead from 1978 in this film. Because Mick and Nub, they end up watching that while they're undead as well on the couch. I like the Rob Zombie music video that they're like when the when they find the dead bodies of their parents before he murders his friends. Uh, Rob Zombie's like film. I think it's his girlfriend at the time who he married, uh, Shelly Moon. I think that's her name, right? Sherry. Shelly Moon. Sherry Moon. Yeah, yeah. So you know she's like basically in all of his music videos, like doing sexy dances and crap. And like they're like, oh yeah, I didn't think they played this music video anymore. And like the dead bodies are right in front of them, man. Great scene. Was it that? I, I am curious about the music video that was. Um... It was Dragula. Oh, I thought it was Pop right. That Coochie. No, it was Dragula. Pop, oh, pop yeah, that they coochie. Do pop that coochie. Pop, pop that's, that that's coochie. When at, that's when he's at his friend's house. It's Pop That Coochie. But when his parents are murdered, it's uh, I believe Dragula. Because, like, remember, he's making the sandwich, there's blood on it, and there's he puts it on, there's mayonnaise and all that crap. Mm -hmm. That music video is playing for a long time. His friends come over, 
music video is still playing. Yeah, then they find the dead bodies. Okay. All right. I'll trust you. So the the parents have names, by the way. We never get we never get the names because they're just credited as mom and dad. But right. I just want to pay some respect to Norma and to Gary, the coolest parents Anton ever had. I is there, are those their names? Yeah, in the script. Mom and dad. In the oh, script, script, they have names. Yeah, okay. I just thought that was funny. Dad and mom Tobias. Why well, she should match the credits with the well? I guess since they didn't. Say it's never their used names at all in the yeah. film. There's no reason. Yeah, Thomas DeLonge was in this film, by the way. If you didn't notice, if you don't know who that is, he was the one of the he's one of the lead singers of uh, Blink One Eighty Two. Yes, I do and know that. What role was he in the, or what he's what did he do food. in the film? Oh, okay. He's the fast food employee. He's like, all right, that's his only line. <laughs> That's so random. That's great. That is a fun fact. And I think that's a great way to round out our fun facts and trivia. Um, cool. Well, we're going to move on to the next segment, which is just talking about kind of what we've been uh, what we've been up to. Anything fun on your side, Clark? Uh, right now, I'm kind of on the self-improvement kick. And I think, did I talk about this last time? Uh, I don't think so. I don't know. I've been working out every day. Uh, I've been, I like have been writing down stuff like goals and things and been playing the guitar. I've been doing all of that. And right now I'm fasting for about 24 hours. I'm trying to, to get as fit as I can before I hit 40 and kind of scared, you know, got five, less than five years left until I hit the, hit the hill. So that's, that's where I am in my existential crisis, my friend. How about you? What are you up to? So last Friday of our recording. Uh, We did something I thought that was just a blast. It was a ton of fun. So uh, there's a very popular game out right now. Uh, It's been out for a long time, I guess, but it's kind of had this surgence um, among us. So last Friday, you, me, uh, Mimic, who's been a guest on the show, popped in and played for a bit. And then just a bunch of other mixture of friends that we've had, people I've worked with at other places, uh, their significant others, two random folks from Twitch, uh, because I did stream while I did it. Although I'm not streaming regularly, so I don't need to plug that. Um, right. But it was a lot of fun. We basically got 10 people together. Um, and we you play this. Uh, it's it's very quick rounds, usually. There's not like a lot of... Uh, it doesn't last for, you know, hours or like anything like that. 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. Unless you're, you you get a really bad killer. But so, <laughs> so out of the 10 people, one of you is an imposter. And all that is is uh, you're a killer. You get to go around killing people. Um, and trying to to you know be the last person standing in the round while all the other people um, yeah sabotage the ship stuff like that while the other uh, crew members are trying to finish tasks and whatever Um, so I just want you know shout out to among us it's it was a lot of fun I think that's probably the most fun I've had on a Friday night since I've been in COVID honestly it was it was just a lot of fun so if anyone's looking for something fun to do got a bunch of friends you guys are all remote things like that this is a great way to connect and, and just, uh, you know, it's, I think it's five bucks on steam right now. It's free on mobile and you can emulate that on your desktop. So, um, you know, there's many ways around trying to play the game together. And I, I just want to, you know, give that game a little plug, a little shout out. Cause we had so much fun doing it. Do it again. I hope so. This Friday, I'm going to, I'm going to message everyone. Um, this Friday, this Friday. Okay. Uh, time to plug our socials. So, uh, I'll go ahead and get, get through that. And then, uh, we'll, bid you all adieu you can follow us on instagram and twitter at two guys horror pod that is the number two guys horror pod you can also email us suggestions at two guys and some horror at gmail.com the two is spelled out there uh once again that is two guys and some horror at gmail.com uh we we recently hit our 1000 total plays for the show um that's huge for us um, and it tells us that we're, you know, heading at least in the right direction as far as we can tell right now. The only place I'm curious about our listeners' opinion is our YouTube channel. What what would you like to see from us more on the YouTube channel for the upcoming season? Um, would you like to see our pretty faces when we're having these conversations? Or is what we're doing good and just keep heading in that direction? You know, let us know. Reach out to us. Hit us up on all the social media platforms. Um, and as always... Thank you so much for listening. 
We're excited for what we have coming up to end the year, and we hope that you guys are excited as well. Take care, guys. Bye.